What's up, everyone? Thanks again for joining for another episode of the Ride MTV podcast. Today, I have a really special treat for you. I got to sit down and do an interview with Dr. Jason Saunders, who is currently undergoing a PhD program in the study of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The reason that I wanted to do this episode is because as a mountain biker and an action sports athlete, concussions have become much too common in my life. I probably had 10, 15 mild to severe concussions or MTBIs throughout my life. And uh, yeah, as I'm getting older, I'm just starting to kind of understand the gravity of that situation and the cumulative effects that can take moving forward in life. And so I've been very interested trying to figure out ways to potentially help reduce the effects of that and maybe heal my brain in some ways. So I wanted to do this podcast with one of the leading authorities in the space and just learn more about the mechanism of, of action and how it does potentially work. Dr. Saunders did an amazing job just being really patient and explaining things on a fundamental level. And yeah, I'm just really excited for you to hear more about it. My interest in hyperbaric oxygen therapy was actually kickstarted several years ago when I read a book called The Concussion Cure. And they talked about hyperbaric as well as some other treatments that potentially help with concussions. So if you haven't seen that book, I would highly recommend checking it out. Dr. Saunders is also the co-founder of HBOTUSA.com and him and his wife, Melissa, run not only that, but they have some coaching programs and a YouTube channel. Um, we have no financial affiliations between us. Uh, I have no financial affiliation with hyperbaric oxygen or anything in that nature. And there's no money exchanged in this podcast. It's just, you know, literally I reached out to him. I told him my story of how I'm super interested in it. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to learn more. And so he decided to sit down and give me some of his time. And I'm really grateful. With that being said, before we jump into it, I just want to say thank you to all of our sponsors for making this episode possible. We couldn't do it without you guys and our Patreon crew. We just appreciate everyone for watching and listening along. And I really hope this episode can be valuable for some people that are dealing with chronic brain injuries or um, just long-term autoimmune issues as well. So with that being said, let's jump into the podcast. And here's Dr. Saunders. Thank you so much for joining me today, Dr. Saunders. I'm really excited to talk to you about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I feel like it's something that's very misunderstood. And the reason I'm really kind of interested in this for the topic of mountain biking and action sports is in regards to concussion therapy. Right now, the most common therapy that people will see or get prescribed is some type of vestibular therapy, which I've also done in the past, you know, balance or kind of eye movement, things like that. However, there's been a lot of good research from what I understand about hyperbarics and its role in concussion treatment. And in the past couple of years, when I was going through some health issues, one of the things that I did was hyperbaric oxygen. And it was really interesting to see the effects it had on my brain and especially with mood stabilization. Um, I've ha hit my head a lot over the years and I just kind of wanted to do a little podcast clarifying some things that I was a little unclear on and also hopefully giving some people some hope that may have uh, MTBI. Absolutely. I'd love to cover as much or all of that as, as we as we can together. For sure. With that being said, how did you get into this field? What like what kind of got you into it? So similar, uh, an injury that wouldn't get better, that didn't have an answer. And um, for me, it was a actually a herniated disc. At the time, I was practicing as a full time chiropractor and helping tons of people with disc issues. And so, you know, I was obviously upset that I got the injury, but I figured, you know, this isn't a big deal. I do this all the time. We should be able to work our way through it. My wife is also a chiropractor. So, you know, we, we did all the things we knew to do. My background was exercise physiology before that. Uh, I have a lot of background in nutrition. So, you know, I'm eating right. I'm keeping my inflammation down. I'm doing all the right, you know, rehab exercises. Melissa's treating me. And ultimately, I was left with a drop foot in my right foot. So it was basically nerve damage from my back. And uh, even though we were doing all the things, you know, that we knew to do, the, the back issue got better pretty quickly, maybe two or three weeks. But 18 months later, I still had a pretty significant drop foot. And so uh, in looking for other potential options, you know, I came across a lot of different things. I actually wasn't even looking at hyperbaric. It, it sort of found me. I was at a conference where they were offering it and I had no idea what it was. I had no, you know, no clue that it would be something that would actually help, but it just looked interesting. So I wanted to try it. And uh about 20 minutes into that session, I started getting like pins and needles in my foot. And that was the first time I actually had any feeling in, in that foot in the last 18 months. And so, you know, I started to think, wow, am I actually, you know, getting oxygen to this area? It's been dormant and now it's seems like it's waking up, you know? Yeah. And um, that that's kind of where that started. I ended up actually, you know, purchasing a chamber and treating myself. And, you know, I got full resolution of that drop foot within a, a matter of a handful of weeks after, you know, 18 months of nothing. And so right there, I was like, I don't know how I got to, you know, I mean, I wasn't that old. I was probably about 26 or 27 at the time, but I was treating patients. I thought I was pretty smart. I was like, how did nobody ever 
even mention this as an option? Mm-hmm. You know, how did I get so far? And I've never even heard of this thing. And so that sort of like put us on a trajectory of really trying to get into the the research, the the mechanics of it, and then all the other things that hyperbaric might actually help with so that we could actually implement it in our office in a meaningful way. That's awesome. And at that time, did they kind of explain to you what hyperbaric is or did you have any understanding of the mechanism of action? I mean, at that time, no, you know, when I when I found when I when I got that response to my foot, you know, I was talking to the guy who put me into the chamber, which was basically a salesperson for the equipment. Mm-hmm. And I started telling him the story. I said, you know, I have this nerve damage in my foot. I'm starting to get some tingling, you know, am I feeling this because of that machine? You know, and he's like, oh, of course, you know, that's that's what this thing does. And and after a few minutes, I'm like, but wouldn't he just say that anyway? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I wasn't sure, but you know, I knew nothing about it. Even, even my, my second patient was my stepdad. Uh, he, he has MS and he was diagnosed with primary progressive MS, uh, not too much earlier than this whole episode with my, with my herniation. And so, you know, knowing very little, knowing a lot about anatomy and physiology, but knowing almost nothing about hyperbaric, we decided, I said, listen, I had a nerve damage. You have nerve damage. My nerve damage is coming from something completely different than yours. But at the end of the Mm -hmm. day, we're both experiencing some some sort of nerve damage. Could oxygen help you too, right? So, you know, I've made up a protocol because I had no idea what I was doing. But, you know, we did a 40-day program and he had incredible changes. You know, his gait narrowed. He got feeling back in his feet. He started walking stairs again, Uh, brain clarity, you know, all kinds of changes. And, you know, 17 years later now, he's doing as good or better than he was even then. And Mm. not that hyperbaric is the only thing we've done, but it's, it's played a huge role in in his recovery. So, you know, it took years to really dive deep enough into the research to pull out all of these mechanisms of action and, and really the right way to understand it so that we can apply it to so many different conditions. Yeah. And it's interesting that you're talking now about the nerve regeneration, because that's one thing that I've read a lot about is stem cell production and nerve regeneration and remyelination. And so essentially trying to kind of, you know, remyelinate and, and cover that sheath or that nerve. Yeah. Is that something that the field even knew that it was really truly doing? Because I know that this is something that they've prescribed for wound healing, correct? Yes. And now it's kind of like, essentially, that was reserved for really acute and uh, severe conditions. And now it's kind of spreading out into more of a wide breadth? Yeah. I mean, a little bit. In other words, in the traditional model of hyperbaric, it's used for wound care. It's used for gangrene. It's used for osteonecrosis, you know, basically life and limb, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to lose your hearing. You might lose your vision. You might lose an actual arm or a leg from some sort of infection. Uh, You've been, you know, radiation burns or thermal burns, like really severe stuff. And, and even then, it's actually hard to get it covered properly, mm-hmm. but it might actually be insurance reimbursable at that, you know, in those stages. For all these other things that I use hyperbaric for, or that I teach other people how to use hyperbaric, TBI as an example, you know, is a, is a great example of that. But a lot of autoimmune conditions and MS and ulcerative colitis and Crohn's, there's so many different conditions that we could use it for. Those are not well accepted really yet, unfortunately, you know, there, there are people in in my field that understand it and do it. But as far as like traditional healthcare goes, that's still, um, it's not as widely accepted yet, uh, but yeah. And that's, that doesn't that's stop us from using it successfully all the time and getting great results, but yeah. And that's kind of when you come to uh billing with insurance companies and all of those issues, because at the end of the day, if they don't accept it, then you're kind of just the patient is on their own a bit. And that's one thing that I noticed when I was going through my issues with my heart and neurological or- disorder. They kept recommending, hey, this could potentially be something that would help because I had postural orthostatic tachycardia. So mm-hmm. it's like an autonomic nervous system disorder. And, you know, when I was telling the doctors and everyone was kind of saying, hey, this is something you might want to try. I was like, well, how do I get it? You know, what do I do? Where do I go? Right. They have Where one at the I hospital. Go? But yeah. And uh, luckily, when I'm, I was in Boise, Idaho at the time, and there's a hyperbaric oxygen therapy clinic there where they were basically doing um, between $150 to $200 a session for hard shell hyperbaric with a oxygen mask. Yeah. And so I was able to get on a program of that and it totally like helped me get back on my feet. Um, so yeah, I understand what you mean where I'm hoping that through your research and your PhD program, 
and everyone else in the field that can actually get more of an accepted use and have people get reimbursed more through insurance to make it more feasible. Yeah, we hope so. I mean, it's a long road. It's it's not, unfortunately, you know, it's not just the data to say, does it or doesn't it work? As an example, mm-hmm. you know, we'll use TBI because it's a TBI is a great example of this. There's a mountain of evidence to support hyperbaric use for TBI. It's not like that hasn't been researched well. It's been researched well. And the overwhelming majority of studies look very favorable. So there's a whole other layer of why things are approved or not approved over time. Yeah. And there's a lot of politics involved in that. But at some point, you know, if we keep, if we keep, you know, really getting good projects done, keep showing the the you know, everybody involved that, you know, hyperbaric is a very viable option for these folks. Uh, and then ultimately, like, like most things, in order for it to really be covered, it has to be, it's really patient demand, mm-hmm. right? Enough patients that are like, you know, really giving their insurance companies a hard time in order to really kind of push that envelope, uh, you know, push it over the, over the finish line. Totally. Well, with that being said, um, can we get into like, what is hyperbaric and what happens in your body? How does it affect your body? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think in, in its most simplistic version, the way I can explain this is to say that um, right now, if, if you know what a pulse oximeter is, you know, the thing you, yeah. they put on your finger at the doctor or the hospital, right? So that's measuring what percentage of your red blood cells are saturated with oxygen. And Basically, as long as you're a healthy human, your lungs are working well, your heart is working well, you know, almost any of us, you would put a pulse oximeter on your finger. It, would, it should say 97, 98, 99, like virtually we are all carrying as much oxygen as we can possibly carry at any given time. And we need a hundred percent saturation or pretty darn close to it just in order to have you know normal function for you and I to sit here and have this conversation for any of the listeners to listen you know, the, the optimum range of oxygen in our body is basically 97 or 98% or more. So, you know, it became, you know, the, the, the pulse oximeter became sort of the standard of care of whether or not somebody should get oxygen as a treatment or not. And that would make sense under normal circumstances, but you're an athlete. So you'll understand this. What do athletes love to do? Athletes, well, you know, in the old days, they would just do it the old fashioned way. They'd go to altitude, right? You would, And why do you go to altitude? Not because there's, you know, people say there's less oxygen. It's really not that there's a less percentage of oxygen, let's say at, in Denver versus in, you know, Miami, but there's less pressure. And because there's less pressure, there's less of a driving force for the oxygen to be sucked out of the atmosphere and driven into your circulation. And so we all know now too, that there's an adaptation to that. If if we go to altitude and the body senses hypoxia is basically what it is. And after the body senses hypoxia, the response to that is we build more red blood cells. And so if I can't saturate my red blood cells completely, then I need more carriers, more taxi cabs to drive this oxygen around my body. Mm-hmm. Also, we know as an athlete, if I train in Denver for a period of a month or two or whatever, it's going to be even if just a few weeks. And then I go and compete in Miami. I now have more red blood cells than the people who've been living in Miami. And so now I have a competitive advantage over those people because increased red blood cells in sea level. And now I'm saturating. Let's say you had 10% more red blood cells than me, right? When you came to Miami to compete. And now you're saturating your red blood cells at the same percentage that I am in Miami. You have a 10% increase of oxygen capacity than I do, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's been observed, that's been well understood and sort of, I don't know if manipulated is the right way word, but (laughs) you know, over the years, and then it got to a point where we're like, well, we could skip that. We could just blood dope, right? We could just figure out ways of trying to, and not that that's legal and I'm not condoning it in any way, shape or form, but as, as an, as athletes, you know, often do, it's like, what's the fastest, most effective way I can get the result that I'm looking for? Well, yeah. The difference between hyperbaric and that whole physiology that I just described is that in order for the red blood cells to increase, so sorry, in order for you to carry more oxygen under normal atmospheric conditions, you would need more red blood cells. 
That's mm. the, the red blood cells are the carrier of oxygen in our body. So if you're already 100% saturated, you can never become more than 100% saturated. You could only have more taxi cabs. Yeah. And for people that maybe are not as familiar with anatomy or physiology, your mm -hmm. blood is not made up 100% of blood cells, right? It's a hematocrit level. You have some like of the plasma volume, and then you have some actual blood cells that are carrying oxygen. Yeah. So that's a good point. So there's, there's liquid, there's the liquid part of your blood, which is basically plasma. And then there's the cells that are in your blood. And we'll just simplify life and say that it's red blood cells, right? Mm -hmm. So red blood cells are these, they, they, their whole purpose in life is just to get oxygen at the lung, deliver oxygen at the cell, pick up carbon dioxide waste products at the cell and get rid of carbon dioxide or those waste products at the lung. And so they're really just a shuttle of gas in order to bring healthy, you know, oxygen into the area and get rid of waste products. Mm -hmm. I know with uh, Tour de France, like a lot of them, they do a biological passport and essentially where they kind of make the cutoff is if you're at 50% hematocrit level to plasma, then mm. that's kind of your, the upper limit of natural physiological that they consider you're okay. And so <clears throat> if you go past the 50% mark, that's when you start to get into getting caught for EPO and blood doping. For blood but doping. then if you're below that, you know, if you're in the high forties or kind of mid forties, then that's really good. And most average right. people are somewhere between like 30 and 45. From right. what I understand, yeah, 45 for an average person that's not doing any of those things or even training for that, you know, you know, 45 would be pretty high, I think. But, um, yeah, exactly. That's those are that's great reference numbers to give. And so what makes hyperbaric different than that whole process is that it's bypassing red blood cell carrying capacity altogether. So right now I'm in Miami. I can only handle right. Let's just say I have. 100, red, you know, I don't, I have a lot more, but let's say I had 100 <laughs> red blood cells and they were 100% saturated. That's the maximum, op, you know, opportunity that I have for oxygen. The difference with a chamber is that instead of trying to get more uh, red blood cells or, or more taxi cabs to deliver this oxygen, what we're doing is by bypassing that, we're just dissolving oxygen into that liquid portion, the plasma. Mm -hmm. We're dissolving oxygen into the plasma of the blood. So now if my body can only handle, you know, this, you know, certain amount of oxygen because of my red blood cells, I can now expand how much oxygen I'm carrying because I'm actually using the liquid portion. The liquid portion of our blood carries almost, I would say almost none, you know, very little oxygen that's free floating, but it, but it becomes a reservoir of almost unlimited oxygen capacity once we start changing atmospheric pressure. And that's basically what a chamber is doing. Instead of at altitude, you lose atmospheric pressure. When you go into a chamber, it's basically creating a temporary increased atmospheric pressure compared to where you live. And what that does is it drives all of this excess oxygen into circulation, allowing you to deliver higher amounts of oxygen to you know these different areas. Mm. Is a good way to think about it for some people, maybe like one of those little soda stream machines where you're injecting CO2 into water and kind of uh, carbonating it and bubbling it, where they basically just pressurize it and they're able to get the gas to dissolve in the liquid. And then when you open the cap, then you'll hear it kind of rush out. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're, you know, when you make seltzer, you're using a liquid water, right? You're pressurizing a gas, carbon dioxide, and you're driving that gas into the liquid. Now, if we had a bottle of water and a bottle of seltzer next to each other, both clear bottles, you couldn't touch them, you couldn't shake them, you couldn't open them, and they had no labels, to some extent, you might not even be able to tell which one was which mm -hmm. until you opened it, right? When you open it, all those bubbles start coming up to the surface because they're no longer trapped in, in, in that pressurized environment. So similar in your body, we're going to use a liquid, we're going to use your plasma, and we're going to use a gas, we're going to use oxygen. We're going to pressurize the oxygen and drive that oxygen into the liquids of your body. And for the period of time where you're in the chamber, just like the soda stream, you keep pushing that button, you can keep pushing more carbon dioxide in. <laughs> for the period of time where you're in the chamber, you're driving every breath you take, you're driving increased levels of oxygen into your system. And as long as you stay in that chamber, that oxygen will stay in circulation, go throughout your body and start nourishing and feeding those tissues. Mm -hmm. But what's interesting is when you get out of the chamber, just like when you open that seltzer bottle, when you get out of the chamber, the oxygen's now trying to escape, except it can't escape. It can't actually leave your body without interacting with your cells. Is that kind of what the, the bends are? You know, when people go deep sea diving, is that 
similar so a little no? bit, except that's nitrogen, right? So if you're not mm. if if you're not getting um, if you're not getting pure oxygen as your breathing gas in the chamber, you, let's say you're breathing air, or like with scuba diving, you're breathing air. Air is predominantly nitrogen. Mm. So if you have nitrogen bubbles trying to get out of your body, that's actually dangerous, and that is what the bends is exactly. If you're on oxygen, either because the chamber is oxygen or the mask you're breathing is oxygen, the amount of nitrogen you're getting is virtually either zero or very close to it. So the same phenomenon happens. You get gas dissolved in your body and you have gas trying to escape. But when you're on air, the gas escaping is predominantly 70, you know, 79% nitrogen. So if it's air, that's a lot of nitrogen trying to get out. But if you're on if you're on 100% or close to 100% oxygen, the gas that's trying to get out is all oxygen. And oxygen, you know, nitrogen is inert. It has no function. It has no use. It has nowhere to go, nowhere to escape. But as oxygen's trying to get out of your body, it's actually interacting with all of your cells, all of your tissues. And I would even say so much as about half of the treatment is the time you spend in the chamber. And about half of the treatment is the time you're out of the chamber for the next four hours, six hours, eight hours, that ultimately you are letting all of this oxygen escape and and really feeding your tissues while it's trying to get out. That's cool. I guess this might be a really broad question to answer succinctly, but why is oxygen important to the body? Like what what is happening there? Is it transporting electrons? Like what is actually happening with oxygen to your body? That's a good question. So kind of uh, for some people, hopefully this will make sense. Hopefully most people understand this, but your car is an example. Your car is needs fuel and it also needs oxygen. So your car engine doesn't just, you know, if you put, if you went to the gas station and got, you know, a full tank of gas, but you didn't have a way to get oxygen into the system, into the engine, that gas would never get oxidized. There would be no power that's created from that, you know, from that process. So you need oxygen and you need fuel in order to create power in a car. Same is true for your body. Our our engine equivalent inside of our cells is called a mitochondria, right? In in eighth grade biology, it was like the, (laughs) you know, the mighty mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, right? So the mitochondria is the little organelle that makes ATP, that makes energy in our body. But if you really look at the biochemistry there, to keep it simple, you need fuel In other words, you need to eat. When we eat, we break the food that we're eating into the smallest molecules possible to extract fuel or energy from, and then we have to oxidize it. We have to oxidize it with oxygen. And so oxygen is this critical ingredient in in fuel combination that allows our cells to make energy. And so if we're trying, like right now, you and I are making a certain amount of energy sitting here. If we were both to go for for a ride, you know, a mountain biking ride, let's say, we're going to use increased levels of energy, which means our cells need to start pumping out higher amounts of cellular energy, ATP. We have a certain amount of fuel in our body, so our body will start using that fuel. But then what what do you notice about your heart rate and your breathing rate when you exercise? It goes up, right? So why does it go up? It goes up because there's all of a sudden there's a demand. I'm I need more oxygen to the working tissue so that I can make enough make, make enough energy. And I need to get rid of all of this waste that I'm creating as a result of this exercise, the carbon dioxide, right? So we're breathing in the oxygen to fuel that system. We're breathing out the carbon dioxide to get rid of that waste. And, you know, oxygen basically acts as a component of the fuel for that entire energy production um, chemistry. Yeah. So essentially uh, a way to put it, I guess, would be that oxygen is the catalyst that allows the reaction to happen, or it's kind of the thing that's allowing the, the reaction to happen. It's yeah. Not only is it a catalyst, let's say it's in chemistry, we talk about rate limiting steps and rate limiting steps means the one step that if we can, if we can change the chemistry at that step, the amount of energy could be exponentially higher. Mm-hmm. Oxygen is one of the most important rate limiting steps to energy production. And one of the reasons is because right now you and I are getting as much oxygen as we can get, mm-hmm. right? There's really no, if you're breathing air, which you and I are, and you're under atmospheric pressure, whatever normal atmospheric pressure is for your location, you're getting the maximum amount of oxygen possible. So because of that, you can only make so much energy. Now, 
if there was somehow a magic way to increase the oxygen your body's getting by changing your atmospheric pressure, that would completely change this game completely. And, and literally, that's what a hyperbaric chamber is doing. Can you explain the role of oxidative stress a little bit? Because, you know, from what I understand, oxidative stress is essentially what makes fruit turn brown. It's what makes meat turn brown. It's causing the decay of many things. So is there that that thought process for some people like, well, isn't it maybe bad to have too much oxygen in your system? Yeah. I don't know how much detail you want there, but I'm going to. Yeah, I'm gonna, go detail. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to cover this from two different angles. One is. um there's oxidation from your outside world, and then there's oxidation from your inside world. As an example, if you are, you know, smoking would oxidize you, right? Uh, alcohol could oxidize you. Um, all the all the EMFs that we're surrounded by causes radiation. It oxidizes us, right? So there's there's all these sources in our environment that are very oxidative. Your body has a. a a system inside, it's an anti, so the opposite of oxidation would be antioxidant, right? We all know about antioxidants, selenium, vitamin E, vitamin C, glutathione. These are just, you know, these are supplements or even things that our body makes that protect us from oxidation. So you could imagine that when we were designed, like when the human was designed, it wasn't designed in the environment that we all live in right now. And so is it possible that you're getting too much oxidation from your environment? Because of all, you know, some things that we, you know, bad habits, but also a lot of things that we have no control over, just like what's going on around us that we can't necessarily choose. So if you're over oxidized from your outside world, the body has a very hard time keeping up with that. And as a result, taking antioxidants, eating fruit and vegetables, which have a ton of antioxidants, taking certain vitamins, which have a lot of antioxidants, that would protect you from that oxidation. Does that all make sense? Yeah. And I guess one thing that I've always heard, and maybe you could help me confirm or deny this, but antioxidants essentially are compounds or molecules that have a free electron that it can lend to cells that are in need of an electron. And then okay. oxidative stress is it's, it's stripping away electrons from cells. Is that what's happening or no? The oxidizer, right, uh, needs that electron to be stable. The antioxidant is what gives that, right? So the antioxidant becomes reduced Right. Mm. So it's redox, reduction in oxidation. Okay. So you have that, essentially that, an oxidizing agent that's that's yearning for an electron and it's going to pull electrons off of healthy cells, or you can take antioxidants, which can then give it to free donate electrons. Donate it to stabilize it, to stop it from being so reactive. Okay. That's interesting. Exactly. So your body makes a ton of these, particularly your body makes, you know, a very common one that we know of is superoxide dismutase and glutathione. Like these are critical molecules in our body to protect you from oxidation. Now, the real reason that that exists isn't because we were going to, we knew we would be surrounded by Wi-Fi towers and, and smoke and all these other things. It was because your body makes its own free radicals as well. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to the car analogy for a second. Mm -hmm. If a car was a hundred percent efficient, it would take your fuel, it would oxidize the fuel and it would have exhaust. The, if it was 100% efficient, the exhaust would actually only be carbon dioxide and water. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you took an organic substance like gasoline and you oxidized it and it was perfectly efficient, the only byproducts are heat, power of some kind, water, and carbon dioxide. But we know that cars also release another chemical that's not good for us that would kill us if we breathe it. Do you know what it is? Carbon monoxide? carbon monoxide, right? So because it's incomplete combustion, the car releases a free radical, carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide, okay? Your body is similar. Your body's going to take fuel that you eat. It's going to mix it with oxygen. It's far more complicated, but we'll just say that that's how it is. And it's going to create power. It's going to create heat. It's going to create water. It's going to create carbon dioxide. You know that because we exhale that. Mm -hmm. But your body also makes a thing called not carbon monoxide, but in our body, we call it superoxide. Okay. So when your mitochondria is making energy, one of the byproducts of energy metabolism is a thing called superoxide. And that's a free radical that we make in our body because of the power conversion of how we make energy. So that's getting free radicals or that's getting oxidized from within. When you get oxidized from within, your body has inside a whole series 
of protective mechanisms, the superoxide, the glutathione, catalase, et cetera. The reason I told you this entire story was this. When you're being oxidized from the outside world, you can very quickly become depleted of your body's antioxidant system. Mm. And so you would need to eat the foods and take the supplements in order to balance that out. Because your body's not accounting for that. Exactly. When you're getting oxidized from within, it actually stimulates an increase in your body's antioxidant system. Mm. So when, this, when the mitochondria makes more free radicals as a result of this increased metabolism, your body picks up on the increase in free radicals. And so it makes more superoxide dismutase, glutathione, catalase, et cetera. It increases the body's ability to protect you from that. Now, the question you asked me is, isn't oxygen an oxidizing therapy? And therefore, isn't there a concern that we're going to get oxidized from the therapy? And the answer is yes, in the short term. No matter what, when you go into the chamber, you're going to get more oxidized than you were before. Long term, if you continue to go in for a while, your body will recognize that increased free radical and actually protect itself, not only from the amount of oxidation you're now getting from the chamber, it's also going to be able to protect you more just from the other sources of oxidation in, in your outside world, inside your environment. And so um, for twofold, it's going to be great that way. Now, what we do in our offices or the people that we train is we always start slow and we build up. So if I think somebody has an autoimmune disease and they're already over oxidized and they have all these issues, I'm not going to put them at the highest pressure I can at the highest percentage of oxygen possible because I don't want to push them too far over that edge. So we start low, we expose them slowly over time until they get a little bit more comfortable. And then once we see that their body is starting to upregulate their antioxidant system, then we can push them as hard as we want because we know that their body will actually protect them from it. That's cool. So you basically give them, you give their body the stimulus and the time to build up this little antioxidant right. army that can then help them handle the additional stress of not only the therapy, but the outside world. Exactly. Is this, um, in some ways, is it similar to like the stress response of sauna or cold tubs and like heat shock or cold shock proteins? Yeah. So we talk about it. We always yeah. talk about hormesis. Is that a term you're familiar with? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is exactly that. It, it goes on the, on the stress curve or on the hormetic curve where you can say in order to have a, in order to have any kind of response, no matter what that response is, there has to be a stimulus, right? So there's a stimulus, then there's a response. And if you do that exercise is the easiest example, right? If you've never exercised a day in your life, and you ran a, ran a marathon the next day, like you would, that stressor would be far too great for your body to handle, right? You wouldn't even be able to complete it, but you would probably really hurt yourself in the process. <laughs> yeah. If you'd never exercised a day in your life and you got up off the couch and you walked around the building three times, that could be considered exercise for you, right? But if you're a marathon runner in contrast and you're training for that marathon, the marathon is a great challenge to your body. You're prepared for it. And walking around the building three times wouldn't even be a stimulus that would be recognized by your body to ever have to adapt to. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do is we have to take that person off the couch, have them walk around the building three times, then 10 times, then jog around the building, then start running around the building. And now we can take them into the street and really start doing some intervals, right? You, you build them up so they get stronger, even though they're breaking down every session is technically what's happening with exercise to some degree. You're breaking tissue down, but but you're creating an environment that allows for healing and recovery and regeneration. And so that over the course of a month or two months or six months or a year, this person is far stronger, far more fit because they challenge their system in a in an intermittent way that allowed their body to get stronger over time as opposed to breaking down over time. Yeah. And from my understanding, the body essentially is always in a state of conservation. Like it always wants to conserve as much energy as possible. And it wants to try to basically atrophy if it doesn't need to maintain or keep something. So in a sense, like what we're doing in life, when we're working out and doing these things is essentially saying, Hey, we need that. We need that. We need that. Let's right. not shut this no, down. Let's we, keep it you going. You can't go away. Exactly. And not only that, but if you started to do, so let's just say, um, we'll just stick with running for now, but Let's say you got to a point where you, you know, couch to 5K, right? So now you're doing 5Ks. If you never worked out a day in your life and you spent, you know, a winter training and then a summer competing in a bunch of 5Ks, you can see tremendous value and change in your body and it would be amazing. 
And if you kept that exact same program for another year, you would lose a majority of those benefits because the body would get so efficient at doing what you're the single thing that you're asking it to do over and over and over and over again, that it doesn't feel challenged anymore. And now it looks for the easiest way possible and you'll start losing endurance. You'll start losing muscle uh, strength, right? Even though you're still exercising. So as you well know, anyone in the, in the exercise industry or in competing, you're constantly changing and varying your intensities. You're constantly changing and varying your durations, right? If you don't create a pattern of constant stress, if you will, right? But healthy stress, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But without that constant stress and constant varying, you'll lose tissue even if you're still active, right? And so um, I look at hyperbaric literally through the same lens. I look at sauna through the same lens. I'm a big proponent of fasting and, and changing our diet also. Like if you ate the same food every day for years and years and years, your body will, even if it was healthy food, your body isn't challenged. It has to be challenged by that food and you have to structure it in a way that keeps the body on its toes, so to speak. Yeah. And you can even see that with dietary things sometimes where people will be sensitive to something like maybe, oh, I have a little bit of a wheat sensitivity and then they completely avoid it and get it out of their diet. And then over time that becomes like a, a severe allergy because their body right. has kind of dropped the defenses completely for that. Right. Um, with all that being said, I have two questions that I kind of want to layer back to back. So for one, are you for or against the use of um, antioxidants while you're doing hyperbaric? You know, I've heard some people say they're doing hyperbaric and their doctor prescribes them like IV glutathione or, you know, like high dose antioxidants to try to combat that stress. Would that undo some of the, the hormesis changes that are happening in your body? And then number two, um, how important is uh, consistency? You know, like if you go, if you go work out one day a week for, you know, three weeks, and then you just hope that your body changes. That's not going to be realistic. How is hyperbaric the same or different? And okay. if you can try to do this, I just wanted to say two, cause they're kind of playing in a role together. Yep. So, um, for the second one first, okay. in, in terms of like, do I need to do this for the rest of my life in order to maintain the benefits or that kind of a thing? It's like sometimes somebody's just trying to heal, right? Yeah. You have I guess maybe I put it, I did a bad job phrasing that question. Oh, okay. I guess what I was trying to say is like when I was doing my therapy, they had me going 60 to 90 minutes a day, every day, five days a week for, for eight weeks. And then I took a one month break and then I did another five days a week for six weeks. It like, how important is that just consistent stress to get that response? Cause oh. I know a lot of people that have said, Hey, I went you know, I went three days a week or I went two days a week and I didn't see a big change. Gotcha. So what's kind of your threshold there? Yeah. So that's okay. I see what you're saying. Um, that's, that's very important because the, there are certain effects that we talk about that are the short-term effects versus the long-term effects. So the short-term mm -hmm. effects are things like, um, more oxygen for ATP production. Like that happens in the first five seconds you're in the chamber. And as long as you're in the chamber, you'll get more of that right? There's some amount of an immune response that's very quick. The first session, two sessions, three sessions, you could have a, a really favorable um, shift in your immune system. So there's certain things that happen very quickly. There's other things that people like the, the things that people really want or that really talk about with hyperbaric are like this, you brought it up, the stem cell response. Uh, it's come up recently, the telomere response, like literally DNA repair, uh, new blood vessels, you know, so injured areas that, that now have damaged blood vessels where I can't even oxygenate this tissue. I want to regrow new blood vessels. Like that stuff takes time. So in order to get a response like that, you're most, in most cases, it would be a minimum of 20 hours, most likely closer to 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 hours over the course of two or three or even maybe four months in some cases. And so you're looking at you know, one of the protocols for a lot of things, you know, we have different protocols for different, but one of the things that comes out of my mouth a lot would be, you know, four to six hours a week for eight to 10 weeks, something where you're, you're, you're bringing your oxygen levels up before they're all the way back down. You're bringing them up again before they're back down all the way. You're bringing them up, right? If you brought it up, you come September 1st, do your first session, right? You then leave that session and now you come back 
October 1st, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like you never, that compounding effect of the wave that you get will never happen. You know, some people would say like, listen, I'm healthy. I, you know, all I really want is like the wellness benefits of hyperbaric. So, you know, I'm thinking I'm just going to come once a month. You know, I, I hear that a lot in our office, but also in, in some of the offices that we coach. And I'm like, listen, if somebody came to me and said, I could either, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do 12 sessions in my whole life. Should I come once a month over the course of a year? Or should I come every day, 12 days in a row? I would tell them to come every day, 12 days in a row. Like mm -hmm. at least they have some chance of getting one of those compounding effects versus this little blip, right? It's, it's just not significant enough to really create some of those major changes. If you were using it rhythmically the way I'm describing, and then you wanted to give little boosts randomly for performance enhancement, mm -hmm. I think that would make sense. Right. So like you're maybe you, say you're already, say, like yeah. if you're doing Monday, make Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then you had a big game on like a Sunday and you just want to boost it that Sunday night and then go again. Or is that kind of what you're saying? hundred percent. Right. Or you've gone through a series of treatments, you've gotten a lot of the benefits and now you're into more of a maintenance thing. So you might only do it once a week. Right. You might do it twice a month or you might say, I have a competition on Sunday. I'm going to come Friday, Saturday, Sunday, just a really like a little blip just to like push something. Mm -hmm. That would make sense. But globally, um, without that consistency, you'll never reach those those kinds of changes. Okay, that's really good um, to hear. Now that we went into that, I already forgot the first question. Yeah, sorry. I, uh, I hate doing layered ones like that. But okay. um, my question was, are you for or against the use of like oh, exogenous right. antioxidants? So... I did a I did a series of videos on that um, on YouTube, and those are some of like the most commonly responded to videos in terms of comments. Mm -hmm. So I apparently is it either, controversial? Like, a struck bit? a nerve or confused people or both. I'm not sure, but there is a benefit to oxidation. In other words, if I just said we're going to eliminate oxidation as a stimuli to the human body we would see enormous increases in disease. Mm. So oxidation is an absolute necessary communication tool from a cellular standpoint. The reason that the fruit, the fruit don't get oxidized while they're on the tree and go bad. They oxidize when you pull them from the tree. They're dead, essentially. Rust is oxidation, right? When metal, metal rust is oxidation, but from a in an in in an alive organism, oxidation stimulates a, a whole cascade of events that are mandatory for healing, inflammation control, immune system balance, hormone regulation, neurotransmitter regulation, all kinds of regenerative processes. Needs you need a little bone uh, bone growth is a great example. You have cells that grow bone. They're mm -hmm. called osteoblasts. Who cares? There's no quiz at the end of this, okay? <laughs> but you also have cells that break bone down. They're called osteoclasts. The stimulus for an osteoblast to lay down bone is the osteoclast removing it. And without the osteoclast removing it, there's no major stimulus for the osteoblast to put new bone down. You see? The, the, our body works in those feedback loops in so many different areas. So at the same time, if I have a patient who's very obviously over oxidized, okay, if you don't mind, I'll use you as an example. Yeah, it's but fine. Between a handful of injuries that now the body's having trouble oxygenating normally, so function has, has changed, and now was exposed maybe to a certain chemical or chemical compound or situation that pushed the immune system into a hyper inflamed state, that person is now definitively over oxidized. POTS is a very common issue. And one of its hallmarks is, is knowing that this person is definitively over oxidized. Mm -hmm. So would I put that person in a 100% oxygen environment at two and a half atmospheres for 90 minutes? No, I think I would push that person way too far. 
might I put them at a lower pressure, like one and a half atmospheres and maybe air only for a little while or enriched oxygen, but it's not a hundred percent oxygen because I don't want to push them as hard as I can right out of the gate, as we talked mm. about earlier. Or I, they're so fragile that yes, they get a glutathione IV or some hydrogen water, or they're on a whole series of antioxidants so that we still get some of the response of hyperbaric, but we're not pushing again. We're protecting them more than we're pushing them. Yeah, you're kind of you're you're oxygenating them and giving them the benefit of the increased oxygen, and then you're trying to on the other on the other hand kind of reduce that stress Upper load. The gonna, oxygenation, exactly. Yeah. But because of that, then they're maybe not getting the hormesis effect as much, but Correct. they're not ready for that, and so it's right. Yeah, and that's just you know, there's um, the 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 doc that I teach a lot of these classes with, is Dr. Joe Dottori. We're finishing a textbook right now. Just it's the art and science of hyperbaric medicine, and like mm -hmm. that's the art, right? That's that's where the art comes in because there's no definitive test. There's no like, oh, okay, you need this pressure, this percentage of oxygen for three sessions of seventy three minutes because we know that that's the amount. You know, yeah, we don't know. These are all conceptual ideas that we teach, and we teach other practitioners so that they understand them, so that we're not just like sending people off and doing, you know, every, you know, like a good American, if some is good, more must be better. But that <laughs> is not the case with, uh, with hyperbarics. Well, technically that's the whole basis of individualized medicine, you know, as you have right. a doctor who is monitoring your response and understands you and your body a bit and then can help guide you. So I think that's really, Isn't that's that really a helpful. Whole idea. Yeah, <laughs> it, it is nowadays. <laughs> um, okay. So kind of the reason I'm kind of going through this line of questioning is I want people to understand, okay, what is actually happening and how could this even potentially make sense that it does work? Cause you know, I've, I've heard this called a pseudoscience by some people in the, in different fields. And I think a lot of people aren't thinking of it like, you know, what is the hormetic effect? How is the stress response happening? What about stem cell production? What about this? What about this? Like you said, the oxygen leaving the body, there's so many kind of modalities that are going on at once. And yeah. I think it's very interesting. Um, and now I want to talk a little bit more about the brain because sure. we talked about mitochondria and, you know, essentially you have oxygen coming into the mitochondria. It has the electron transport chain and then you, it produces ATP, which your body uses as fuel. What is different with the mitochondria versus like a brain neuron? And does your brain have mitochondria in it as well? And like, because from what I understand, the neuron is what's basically doing all the signaling in the brain and, and having function. Or when you're hyperbaric, when you're hyper oxygenating someone, is it not even about neuron regrowth? Is it more about just getting areas of the brain that are online that were offline or... Like, how does this work within the brain and MTBI? Okay. Um, we could probably do an entire show just on that question. <laughs> um, but let me say this. So number one, yes, neurons do have mitochondria. So any cell that has a job has to create energy to do that job. So you're, um, nothing's this simple, but I'll just say that it is. Your liver has mitochondria, it makes energy, and the energy that it makes, it uses to detoxify your body, mm -hmm. something like that. Your intestines have mitochondria, and you, you, they use that energy to move food substances through the tube, but also to extract nutrients and get rid of waste, et cetera, right? Your heart has mitochondria, it uses that as a muscle to pump blood throughout your system. Mm -hmm. Your brain, your neurons have mitochondria, and their job is signaling right? Synapses, connections, creating neurotransmitters, sending neurotransmitters across a gap, you know? So all of these things that are energy dependent require mitochondria and every cell, depending on how metabolically active the tissue is, would determine how many mitochondria it has. So the brain is, to, to give you perspective, the brain makes up about 2% of your body mass mm -hmm. and it uses up about 20 to 25% of all of your oxygen. So it's a very small organ and it's using up an enormously high percentage of oxygen relative to it, right? So that gives you a sense for how metabolically active it, it is, which also would give you a sense percentage of mitochondria that have to be in that tissue in order to use. That's, it is the mitochondria that is consuming that oxygen. Mm -hmm. okay? Does hyperbaric improve neuron connection and synapse? And so, yes, you know, there's an entire avenue of, of the research right now looking at 
what would be considered neurogenesis, like literally rebuilding, healing, and regenerating nerve cells. And that's not just peripheral nerve cells, like in your arms, your legs, and you know, in your body. It's also central nervous system stem cells that are being stimulated and helping to regenerate. And that would be like spinal cord and brain. And so all of those tissues seem to be affected favorably through hyperbaric. But to your point, the pseudoscience, I mean, that's kind of what got me into this, right? It was like, either it's a bunch of BS, right? And that's why nobody told me about it. Or nobody actually understands it and therefore ignored, right? And that's all. I just wanted to answer that question. You know, did it help me? Yes. Am I going to use it on patients? Not if it was like a, a one-off, you know, it, just a coincidence that I used it, it helped me. If it, but if it made sense, then I wanted to understand why. Mm -hmm. And so hyperbaric gets a lot of bad press from the standpoint that like, how could any one tool help treat so many different conditions? That's why people in traditional medicine, I think, like, are, they're skeptical of it because it sounds too good to be it. true. Yeah. yeah. They're not attracted to it. It's like nothing could be that good, you know? But going back to rate limiting factors, yeah, isn't that kind of the basis of this where you're you're impacting the entire body on such a small level? Well, that's it. The The argument, if, if we want to call it an argument, the argument is it's not treating anything. Even, even when we use it traditionally for wound care or gangrene, I would argue it's not treating any of those diseases. And if we want to say that this tool treats all these conditions, then I would agree. Then we have a problem that is hard to get past, you know, mentally for, for most doctors and, and scientists alike. Mm -hmm. But if we just broke it down to something so simple and said, listen, it doesn't treat anything. However, is oxygen necessary for every function in the human body? Virtually, yes. Are you limited to how much oxygen you could get at any given time based on red blood cell carrying capacity, percentage of oxygen in the air we're breathing, right? And atmospheric pressure? Yes. And if I could prove that getting more oxygen into your body influenced cellular function, could we at least agree that that increased cellular function should lead to an increased capacity to heal, to regenerate, to whatever we're trying to do, right? And that's that's how I believe, which is why, you know, in writing the curriculum for the courses that I teach, we focus so much time on mechanisms of action because that's all we should care about. Like if a human goes in and that changes the immune... So, okay, so you mentioned the PhD, right? So a couple of years ago, I decided to go back to school. I was like, I hate saying I don't know to people. That's like <laughs> my biggest nightmare. So, you know, I say that so I, I, even finishing the PhD, I think I say it more now than I did <laughs> even then, but I felt like there were certain things I really wanted the answers to. And so, you know, I, I go into molecular biology, like literally the, the smallest molecules you can think of making a cell function properly. And then a group of cells that can make a tissue function properly, that make an organ function properly, a system, and then eventually an organism, right? So we're studying it like on the smallest level possible. And I felt like if we just understood what role oxygen plays or when a cell is damaged, why, why do some cells get, you know, why do some cells repair and other ones don't? You know, why do some people repair better than others? What are the differences, right? And so the research mm -hmm. that I did for the PhD was on healthy people. Because I didn't want to prove that, as an example, hyperbaric improves inflammation in someone with MS, which I know that it will. I wanted to prove this person says that they're healthy. I, I think you'll probably agree just based on conversations we're having, but like the average American is probably not that healthy. <laughs> we call them healthy, right? We say, you know, if you're asymptomatic and you're not diagnosed with a specific disease, we categorize those people as healthy. But as you and I know, there's yeah. a far cry between asymptomatic and actually being healthy. Well, it's but, like if you're if your grading curve in school is like a C minus, then right. <laughs> you know, hundred percent exactly. Which is really where medicine, right? So many of the tests in medicine have allowed that to happen. So we we have to say that a certain subset of the population are healthy, and as the as the labs we run on people are shifting in the wrong direction, our curve broadens to allow for, you know, bigger, 
you know, underlying issues to exist before we actually diagnose people, which is a, a huge part of the problem. But anyway, if at the end you could say that you took a healthy human, healthy human in quotations, right? Um, if you could take a healthy human and reduce their inflammation, right? If we could agree, I can get most doctors to agree that mitochondrial dysfunction and inflammation are at the root of almost every chronic illness that we know of. Mm -hmm. The sources of information, inflammation may vary. The consequences of the mitochondrial effects might, might vary from person, but those two things are absolutely at the root of almost all the things that you and I are hoping to avoid in our later years. Mm -hmm. And so if I could take a quote unquote healthy person and improve their mitochondrial performance and reduce their inflammation at a moment in their life where they had no disease, could we then study those people long term to say, are, are we starting to see a level of prevention or, you know, shifting, you know, physiology in a, in the law in a longer term way? And that was really the purpose of this research. Now, the research I did was really a, like a more of a pilot study to start answering some of those questions. But I can't even tell you how many amazing results we're finding in there to prove that exactly what I'm saying to be true. So I'm excited to see where that actually ends up you know, getting pushed in the future. That's cool. And I think what you're just speaking on it, it kind of uh, reminded me of that whole telomere length argument. And then you're seeing the hyperbaric oxygen stuff pop up a lot in the anti-aging community where you have right. these multimillionaires or billionaires that are spending, you know, millions of dollars a year trying to stay young forever, essentially. And they have the in-home HBOT systems and, you know, a nurse on staff and they do it all the right. time. So <laughs> it's, it is we really should, interesting. We, I thought everybody has that. Not everybody. Has <laughs> no, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I was actually going to ask you, you know, for a lot of people, this therapy, it, it sounds amazing. And it's one of those things where it's like, yes, I want to try to get in a chamber, but how do you find one? Or how do you, how do you start to actually use the therapy? And, you know, a lot of people now you're seeing mild, mild hyperbaric or soft shell hyperbaric chambers pop up kind of everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, my first experience with hyperbaric actually was at a brain and body doctor. Uh, we were doing vestibular therapy and they put me in a hyperbaric soft shell and they just had an oxygen concentrator. So, you know, it's like room air oxygen concentrator and they're charging 200 bucks a session. And I was like, this is a little bit, a little bit weird, but it got me thinking. And so I guess the question I have is, is mild hyperbaric or soft shell hyperbaric something that's more attainable for people? And is that worth doing? Or is like hard shell really where you're seeing most of the benefits? And I guess that probably is a hard question to answer because you have different severity or different, uh, you know, goals of outcome too. Right. But. So I think that's exactly where that conversation starts is we use this word hyperbaric to describe, you know, those soft chambers go to, let's, we'll just put numbers to it. Okay. So soft chambers go to a, an atmospheric pressure 1.3 ATA. Okay. Which basically means a 30% increase in atmospheric pressure. Mm -hmm. And let's say hard chamber, the highest anyone could ever even go, especially if they're on oxygen would be um, three atmospheres, okay? If you're on air, you can go deeper, but let's just say, let's say that's like the theoretical clinical range of pressure would be from 1.3 to 3.0. Um, I think our job is to match the intensity of our therapy to the severity of the condition. In other words, Wound care is typically treated at 2.4. We don't treat the wounds at 3.0. We treat wounds at 2.4. Car, car, which is not, it's, it's not life-threatening. It's maybe it's limb-threatening, but we have time. We have, we have days and weeks. It's not like we have hours, right? Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide poisoning is treated at basically 2.8 to 3.0. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're actually going to die and this could save your life. And it could do so in this, you know, it could, it could reduce the half-life of carbon monoxide in like 20 minutes, 23 minutes. So that's enormous, right? That's important. And so we're not going to treat that slowly. We're going to, I'm sorry you're over-oxidized and you have this autoimmune disease, but carbon monoxide poisoning may kill you. We're going to the highest level possible. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that, that goes against what my recommendations were before, right? But, but it's important because it's life, it's life saving in that moment. But if I have somebody with a chronic TBI, 
do I have to treat that person at the same pressure that I would treat somebody with gangrene or wound mm. care at 2.4? Like that seems excessive to me. So I believe that the full, and, and I can't prove all of this because we haven't done enough of the research yet, but I, I believe that most chronic issues could be treated between 1.3 and 2.0. Mm. I, it's, it's rare that I think a lot of these things need to go above 2.0. Um, between two and 2.4, I believe is where more of the severe stuff, you know, the limb saving, um, treatment protocols live and above 2.4 is where like a very acute life-saving event would likely live, you know, something like that. Now, the research that we did do compared 1.3 to 2.0, because that's the question I get all the time. <laughs> so I said, I need to start answering that question. I have to stop saying, I don't know. So I can't tell you all the details. I'm, I'm literally analyzing the data as we speak, but there were certain things like um, telomere length or even cellular aging uh, as a general guideline was impacted by both lower pressures and higher pressures, but it was impacted greater at higher pressures. Okay. So they both did it, but it was a bigger effect in the higher pressure than the lower pressure. Um, inflammation, both of them affected inflammation tremendously, very similarly, but there was a higher impact at higher pressure than lower pressure, mm -hmm. as an example. Um, so depending, you know, I don't think most of these things are a rush. I think most of the things that like you and I would be interested in treating, those are, they're lifestyle issues. Mm -hmm. If you keep doing what you do, what's the chances you're going to have another concussion? High. Yeah, definitely right? high. It's not really if, it's just when. Yeah. And so should this therapy be something that's ongoing in your life, both to continue to heal from past exposures and then to prepare your body to heal faster from the next encounter, you're you're never going to get me to argue the that that's a no. Like that's a that's a yes a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. So for people that are dealing with kind of these low grade or not low grade even, but like mid grade chronic conditions that they're dealing with, and it, it affects them in a sense where they want to they want to start addressing it. If they have no way to access a hard shell hyperbaric or it's just way too cost prohibitive, then potentially they could get a soft shell and do that therapy on their own right. and start trying to treat it. It'll become right. It'll, it'll become far more about time than pressure at that point. So frequency and duration over longer periods of time. Now, if somebody had an acute concussion, lost consciousness, right. And I wanted to catch them and do something significant. I might go to 1.5 instead of 1.3 because I'm catching them in this moment that I'm really trying to reduce inflammation stimulate some stem cells, stimulate some oxygen and blood flow and some healing. So I might be a little bit more aggressive, but when we're talking about chronic stuff, usually it's, it, we're just not in a rush. It's going to have to be something that we do for a long period of time. Yeah. And with that being said, with the oxygen concentrator versus supplemental oxygen, like, is it possible? Do you see people that have in-home setups where they have a soft shell chamber and they have just like a little oxygen tank running outside of it and then a mask that they put on and they can do that themselves? Or is that always a nurse administered thing as well? So you, you cannot have like a green bottle, like a hundred percent oxygen green bottle going to a soft chamber. Mm -hmm. So that always would be like a concentrator environment. You need a prescription, like you would need a prescription for the chamber. It's a prescriptive device. You would need a prescription for even a concentrate oxygen concentrator. It's a prescription device. Assuming you had a prescription for those things, you could operate those things, you know, safely in a home environment. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. That's one thing I'm always like, oh man, I want to keep doing the therapy because I still have some lingering autoimmune issues. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talking a little bit about the autoimmune side, um, you hear a lot of talk about cytokine and interleukin, which are like pro-inflammatory proteins. And with hyperbaric, have you guys seen like a mediated immune response where people are, are also kind of getting their immune system calm down and function more properly? And is that due to the breakdown of things like cytokine and interleukin? Or do you have any ideas of what the mechanism of, of action is on that? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's both. Like in, in a lot of cases, those are the chemicals that are also causing the tissue damage. Like 
in Crohn's and colitis or, you know, in a variety of autoimmune diseases, that's just the body's being over oxidized, right? And these inflammatory chemicals are breaking tissues down. But as an example, in that research that I was telling you that we just did, I mean, we looked at 81 different cytokines. Mm-hmm. Of 81 different cytokines, the soft chamber had a positive effect, interleukin, like TNF alpha, interleukin 8, 6, 12, I mean, a lot of different um, uh, cytokines in this mix. Uh, in the soft chamber, 32 of them were statistically significantly reduced. And in the higher chamber, I think 41 of them were same, the same group, but there were a few additional ones in the hard chamber. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're, you're literally shifting from an inflammatory immune response to an anti-inflammatory re- re- immune response as part of those hyperbaric exposures. Okay. And this again, like, sorry for asking so many questions, but I just, I am really interested in all this stuff, but yeah, no, it's good. what is in your, I guess, summary, what is inflammation? Cause you always hear that being thrown around all the time. Like what is an inflammatory response? So, um, in short, an inflammatory response means your immune system is getting involved. Okay. One part of your immune system, let's say, is in charge of fighting, you know, directly fighting infections. And different parts of your immune system are involved in, like, the preparation of controlling an area so that it doesn't become infected and then sort of stimulating the next cascade of the healing response. So in other words, if I got a cut, right, that cut has to stop bleeding. It has to clot, right? Then those, those fibers don't, you know, a scab in the initial phases, a scab looks very different, acts very different and, and cellularly is very different than what the skin is going to look like a few weeks later. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. So in order for when you first get a cut, like all those areas start to get reddened, right? They, infl- they, they swell a little bit. That's an inflammatory response. In order for that initial phase of homeostasis in that area to occur, there needs to be an inflammatory response. So it's essentially just like the signaling, the body is signaling to the immune system or the immune system is signaling to the body, hey, there's a problem here. We need to address right. this. And then Correct. the problem is when you have chronic inflammation where your body is chronically in a state of saying, hey, we have a problem, we have a problem, right. we have a problem. And there's there's two things that happen. One is like in a wound, and that this wound could be on your skin, but this wound could be in your brain, okay? It's not any different. If that inflammatory response is an overreactive response, or if you lose the oxygen gradient, the oxygen gradient is literally what what moves a, a, a tissue from what's called the inflammatory phase of healing to the proliferative phase of healing, which is the next phase. So the swelling, the redness, you know, the all the edema, like that's all part of the inflamm- the, the pain, that's all part of the inflammatory response. And then we should shift into this proliferative phase, which is where growth factors are stimulated and, and healing and regeneration occur. Mm. If you don't have oxygen in that tissue, you don't, you don't get to leave the inflammatory phase and get into the proliferative phase. So skin, you know, skin ulcers that aren't healing well, they, they don't have an oxygen gradient. Crohn's and colitis are like ulcers in your intestines. They don't have an oxygen gradient. The oxygen gradient pushes people into the proliferative phase of healing. The other version of that is like an autoimmunity where the body's recognizing something is foreign that either isn't foreign or is foreign and is in the wrong location or whatever. And now your immune response is just like, constantly or you're eating certain foods that your body's sensitive to. So it's like every, at every time the immune system takes a turn, it's like, it's, it's fighting constantly. So then it becomes hardwired to stay in that aggressive, you know, fight stance and inflammation over time ends up building up. Yeah. I know after my reaction, my, my IgE level, like, you know, your immunoglobulin type E, my IgE level is 883. And so- yeah, so this is chronic, just everything. Like even if you, you know, some of my friends, if you like hit their skin, then they break out in hives because their inflammatory I, response is so ready to go. But um, yeah, so this is this has been super helpful. I think 
one of the last things I'd maybe want to touch on is we haven't really talked much about um, increasing vasculature. And one of the things I did, at least for the concussion side, is I did a QEEG where they're kind of measuring your brain waves and um, the voltages within your brain. And so then I was really low voltage in the back where I've had several pretty hard concussions, like slap in the back of my head. After we did hyperbaric and, you know, did all that, I did a subsequent QEEG and they saw increased brain function in the occipital lobe. Can you talk to what is maybe going on there? Like when you're doing hyperbaric, you're hyper oxygenating, the body's looking for a way to offload some of that oxygen and it starts opening up these different pathways and capillaries and everything. Is that, is that correct? Or how does the brain actually come back online with this yeah. therapy? So because the brain is so metabolic, I mean, this is just an easier way to explain, I think, some of this. So hopefully this will make sense mm -hmm. um, primarily to the audience. But because your brain is so metabolically active, it requires a huge oxygen supply. Because it requires such a huge oxygen supply, if there's ever a period of time where that oxygen supply is lost, it would almost be like, it almost be like the engine of your car not having oil mm -hmm. and the whole engine would heat up and fry, right? That would be terrible. And so in an attempt to save the tissue so that the tissue doesn't die, it actually just turns down the activity level and puts it into almost like hibernation mode. Mm. And so you get these areas of the brain that are cellularly intact, but they're not functioning and they're basically sleeping, dormant, you know, dormant tissue, if you will. So there's two things that hyperbaric does to fix that. The first is in the short term. And the reason that it's, the reason that that happened was the blood vessels that delivered oxygen to that tissue were damaged. So if the blood vessels were damaged, oxygen couldn't get there. And then the question became, do I let this tissue die or do I just kind of put it into some dormant state? When you go into the chamber right away, you're just driving oxygen that would never have been able to get there to get there, right? So in some cases, there are profound changes that occur for people with brain injuries because all of a sudden this starving tissue now has a supply of oxygen. Now, that profound effect initially might also be relative to how quickly somebody gets in there, uh, you know, in terms of the, the timeline between the injury and the exposure to oxygen. Unfortunately, yeah, like a lot of people, it's years. However, so it might be whether like, the brain is in sleep mode or deep sleep mode based on exactly. how long it's been. Right, right. Do I have to just like shake the mouse or do I have to like reboot this whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if I had somebody like my kid had a, an acute concussion, like we did 10 hours in the chamber as fast as possible, basically one hour twice a day for five days. To me, if every person on planet Earth did that as their concussion protocol, we wouldn't have the cumulative effect of concussions over time. Mm. Okay. But, you know, a lot of this is ends up like years later and we're looking at retrospectively and, you know, from old, old injuries. But so the short term is we're going to oxygenate it right away. The long term is, um, there's a thing called angiogenesis. So like literally stimulating chemicals that rebuild and heal new blood vessels. So this area that was injured where all these capillaries were broken and never healed properly, so it got stuck in the inflammatory phase of healing, and it never recaptured its blood supply. In the first 10 hours, let's say, we're just, we're just loading it up with tons of oxygen. And in the second 10 hours, now we're starting to stimulate new capillaries to grow so that once we pull the therapy away, we can still see that now the body can self-oxygenate because all those pathways have been rebuilt. That would be a minimum of 20 hours. It's probably closer to 30 or 40, but okay. you know, 20 hours, you would still see some of that happening. Have you gotten pulled in to work with uh, the NFL or any sporting leagues with this type of therapy? So I work with a bunch of the athletes independently. I, I find in sports, it's hard because in sports, if I do something and I find out that it works, I don't necessarily want anyone else to know about it. Mm. There's a little bit of that that goes on. So, you know, I do work with quite a few athletes in, in, a, in a whole slew of different, you know, hockey, soccer, uh, football, you know, a lot of sport, more of the extreme, at, you know, the, the dirt bike riders, the skateboarders, the surfers, uh, everybody, you know, all these people have brain trauma. Um, there are some teams, there are a few teams that have been starting to put them in their like training facilities and such. Uh, but I find that they still don't, the players don't really 
if the players knew what they were doing, like what the chambers were actually doing for them, mm-hmm. they would use them. Those players are using them in their home. If they don't really get it conceptually yet, like what is this thing actually really doing for me? You know, I'm not finding that the, the teams are getting great uptake right now. Um, Cause it's a, it's a, as you well now know, it's a time commitment. If you're not willing to put the time in, you're not going to get the response. Right. So I see it growing exponentially. Um, just the fact that teams have started putting them in their training facilities is a huge movement in the right direction. Um, but again, this needs to be, in my opinion, like a football player, like off season can use it in certain doses as like a recovery from the season before, but real time, you know, most of these guys should be using it after most games, almost every game, you know, if they got a good hit, they should use, you know, five or six hours every day, like in a row, you know, there's, there's very specific ways that those protocols could be developed uh, or are developed, but the, the, I don't know that the teams and the trainers are, are aware of them yet. Where would, uh, where would someone maybe reach out to you to get in touch if they were more interested in learning about this or wanting to kind of be a part of what you guys have going on with HBOT USA? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so HBOTUSA.com is our main website. All that is really is education. So it's like, how does this thing work? Why does it work? What does it do? What's it good for? Who should consider? You know, it's really, you know, we built that website as a tool just to have education be, as you said, it's underutilized, it's misunderstood. And therefore, you know, it still seems like this is a brand new therapy. It's like 300 years old. But uh, so, so people can check us out through there. I have a YouTube channel. It's also, I think it's, I think it's just HBOT USA is our YouTube channel. Uh, I think I have close to 300 videos on all kinds of different topics on there. And, you know, we put one out a week and just try to keep a good stream of information out there about hyperbaric oxygen. Um, the HBOT course.com. That's where we are teaching our classes are, are that live. So, you know, safety courses, technician courses, clinician courses, you know, all the things that people need to really like, if somebody was going to be operating one or running one or, or wanting to operate a business, like that's where a lot of that stuff lives. But, you know, there's email contact through all of those places. And so, uh, someone could shoot us a message at any time and ask some questions or get some feedback. Yeah, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing, honestly. Like the service has been huge and it's helped a lot of my friends that are also dealing with similar situations what I had to deal with. And I'm hoping it can help a lot more people in the future with concussion and kind of chronic yeah, illness. Me too. So yeah, I, I really appreciate you and everything you're doing. And yeah, I just can't say enough good words about you. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I really hope you guys enjoyed that podcast. That was extremely interesting for me, at least. <laughs> um, I don't know. I really enjoyed talking to Jason and you can tell just from speaking to him that he really understands and knows this at a fundamental level. Um, I think we could have done a multi-hour podcast, but I asked him to do an hour and he went above and beyond and did more than that. So I was really, really stoked. And yeah, I just can't say thank you to them enough. Again, check out his website or YouTube channel if you want to learn more. If you have any other questions, let me know and I can try to answer them or I can get Jason to answer them. And yeah, like I said, there's a lot of good uh, resources on this whole topic. If you want to read a book about the whole concussion side, I would highly recommend a book that I read several years ago called The Concussion Cure. And yeah, just in general, I hope you guys took something away from this and we'll talk to you guys on the next episode. So thanks again. See you later. You. But actually, just one one last little question. Sure. Um, and this could be off the record or on the record, but what are some of the incentive structures that are at play that are kind of keeping this from being more well-studied? And is it truly from one of the doctors I talked to, they said, well, the problem is you can't patent oxygen and pressure. Is right. that really as simple so, as it is? I mean, that's, uh, if, if I'm making up a story, but like if Merck could somehow do that, mm-hmm. right. They were like, well, we patented this version of that story somehow. Would they be more likely to do it? Yes. But I still think that they wouldn't because I believe that there's lack of interest in curing anything. Mm. And so, you know, if we fix this or that, then we don't need this or that. And that's not really part of that business model. Um, so really it comes down to people like me who there are many people like me, but just giving a shit enough about it to do something about it. But like, 
you know, who's at 40, what did I start school? I was 41 when I went back to school. Like who's going to fucking do a PhD program at 41 just to do research. That's going to, you know, the research project I'm doing costs a quarter million dollars. Who wants to do that? (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's hard, you know, that's a hard pill to swallow. What I'm really hopeful for is that this research that I just did, once we publish it, just stimulates enough of like a, oh, I think people are afraid. People who do soft chambers are afraid to find out that what they've been saying they do, they might not do. And so they feel like they're confident that they do because they see it every day. They see the benefit. But like, what if we tried to do the research and it turned out I was lying or I was wrong or whatever, whatever, right? Then it would So there's a fear that like, maybe it's not as strong or as potent or as effective as I like to make it sound like it is. And on the heart chamber side, people don't, I mean, especially in traditional medicine, like they just don't care. They're just getting paid to do wound care, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So it's just, it, it, it like lives in this void. It's like the stepchild of, you know, of medicine that just like got forgotten and isn't that exciting to people. However, it's it's one of the safest and has one of the most profound effects that are available in medicine. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's really, obviously I'm excited about it, you know, and, you know, I think we've certified over 500 people so far. So like that's 500 people that didn't know anything about hyperbat and that's only in a few years. So like, you know, it's 500 people that are now operating clinics somewhere, you know, treating patients. They're excited about it. They're telling the truth about it because I make sure that, you know, they leave those classes with all the information I have in my brain, what they should and can say and what they shouldn't and what they can't say <laughs> so that it's a little bit more of a unified message. You know, that's been that's been another problem in the industry is the message isn't unified. Yeah. And so people say make crazy claims and that adds to the pseudoscience issue, you know. Yeah, uh, that's why I wanted to touch base with you, because from everyone that I have seen, you are definitely the most clear thought and concise and, you know, I guess the least sales many, if that makes sense. And I think Mm -hmm. it's been really nice just to listen to you speak and it's helped a lot of people I know. And I guess if you were to say like, what is, what is the number one side effect? If they're like, what is the negative side effect of hyperbaric? What there has to be a downside. What is the downside? I mean, there's a few, what I would say is the only downside to really using it for you and I, for the way you and I would use it is time. Like the impl- the reason that the, the, sh- the challenge to implementation is cost and time. Mm-hmm. Those are not side effects, but those are, that's once everybody understands, holy shit, this thing's amazing. It could really help a lot of people. The next thing to, oh, the next hurdle is money and time. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's just the reality of where it is right now. That's fine. Those things will get better the time may not get better, but the money, like it'll become more affordable. That's the other reason I'm doing this is like the more chambers, the more clinics, it'll just, it'll force it to become more affordable. Um, but side effect wise, there's only like, it it becomes dangerous at higher pressures. Like oxygen toxicity is a thing, which really only begins above two atmospheres anyway. So like below two atmospheres, that's really not much of a conversation. Um, and then ears, like people who don't know how to equalize their ears that can't figure out how to handle the pressure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, you you could have tympanic membrane damage. You could have some issues like that. Um, so, but that's it. There's yeah. nothing else. 